Hey folks, welcome back to the Sedgwick Jimmy channel. We're certainly glad to see you and today we're going on a voyage of knowledge on one of the worst cruises in history, the final mission of the USS Indianapolis. Some of you may remember it from the story Quint tells in the movie Jaws. Some of you have never heard about it at all and have no clue what I'm talking about, but either way, let's get into it. The Indianapolis was one of two ships built as part of the Portland class of heavy cruisers, the other being the USS Portland. I know, imagine that. It was officially launched on November 7th, 1931, and spent its first eight years as a flagship for Scouting Force One and even carried President Franklin D. Roosevelt twice. Once the Second World War started, it was used as the flagship for Admiral Raymond Spruance while he commanded the Fifth Fleet in the Pacific Theater, but we're here to talk about her last mission. In July of 1945, the ship received orders for a secret mission to Tinian Island, during which they would be carrying crucial parts of Little Boy. Little Boy being the code name for the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, the... Little Boy being the code name for the atomic draw... Little Boy being the code name for the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Yeah! being the first atomic weapon ever used in warfare. Part of their cargo was the bomb's load of enriched uranium, which made up roughly half the enriched uranium that the world had at that point. So it's rather important. Fun little fact, her voyage from San Francisco to Pearl Harbor was completed in 74 and a half hours, which is a speed record that still stands to this day. She arrived in Tinian on July 26th, delivering the parts before heading to Guam in order to change out sailors that had met the end of their tour. The ship left Guam on the 28th with expectations of eventually reaching Okinawa. However, just after midnight on the 30th, she was hit with two torpedoes from a Japanese submarine and sank within 15 minutes. 300 of the 1,195 crew members died when the ship sank, some considering them to be the lucky ones. Roughly 900 men went into the water. Now, she was expected at Leyte, an American base in the Philippines on the 31st. However, because she was a larger ship, the command of the island did not keep track of her through reports, but rather through predictions. So, even though she didn't arrive on the 31st, she was marked in as having arrived. This furthered the complications. The 900 sailors in the water first had to contend with a lack of life jackets, as many of them didn't grab them before jumping overboard, and the fact that oil had poured into the ocean all around them. After they had attempted to escape the oil, eventually the sun came up, and their first long day began. With no food or water or shelter, they were left to the elements. The sun baked anything above the water and beneath the water. Well, a lot of men were wounded, and the blood seeping into the ocean kind of attracted sharks. A lot of sharks. As many of the men succumbed to their wounds, they were picked off from below. Trapped between a burning sun above and a circling frenzy of teeth below them, the men waited for night as it would cool things off. However, many died of hypothermia due to the cold night temperatures, in which time they were taken away by the sharks. There's a story of the ship's chaplain that had been tied around the waist to a raft and was floating behind it, bobbing up and down with the waves. It took several days for someone to check on him and discovered that his bottom half had been eaten and his torso had been left to float on. In the heat of the second day, some began to drink seawater in order to fight the growing dehydration. But, as many of you know, this only made things worse. Many became delirious, claiming that the ship's mess hall was open, only to swim down and be eaten by sharks. Some turned against each other, slashing at each other with knives, drawing more blood, and, you guessed it, drawing more sharks. At around 11 in the morning on the third day, August 2nd, a patrol plane spotted the survivors in the water and dropped a radio beacon, calling out for any and all vehicles capable of rescue to head to that point. The first to arrive was a seaplane piloted by Lieutenant Commander Robert Marks. After attempts to drop life rafts to the men failed, he took a vote from his crew and against orders he landed his plane on the open ocean, allowing for sailors to climb aboard and out of the water. When the plane was full, they began to lash men onto the wings, which ended up making the plane completely unflyable and it ended up having to be destroyed. Many survivors saw this as the worst part of their ordeal, waiting to get out of the water and away from the sharks hoping and praying that they wouldn't be taken before they get their turn to get out. That night, the first of seven rescue ships arrived and set up her lights as a beacon for the other ships to follow. They arrived and the remaining men were rescued. 316 men came out of the water alive out of the original 900 or so that went in. 
and even though they were rescued, their trial wasn't over. See, this was a massive screw up by the Navy, and somebody had to take the blame, and unfortunately, that man was Captain Charles McVeigh. He was court-martialed for failing to sail in a zigzag pattern, making the ship more susceptible to attack. However, he had been instructed that speed was more important that the seas were clear. The Navy didn't even allow them an escort, which was normal procedure at the time. At his trial, even the Japanese commander of the submarine that sank the Indianapolis, Mokichu Mokitsura Hashimoto, testified that a zigzag pattern wouldn't have helped in any way. Many felt that the Navy was simply using McVeigh as a scapegoat, and its sentence was eventually remitted by Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz. McVeigh returned to active duty, though the guilt of losing so many men and the hate mail he received from many of the deceased sailors' families wore heavily on. He eventually killed himself with his Navy revolver. He was found in his front yard, clutching a toy sailor in one hand and the gun in the other. For years, McVeigh's men fought for his innocence, and it wasn't until 1996 when a 12-year-old student from Pensacola, Florida named Hunter Scott interviewed survivors and reviewed the official documents as part of a school project leading to him testifying before Congress on his findings in an official exoneration was signed by President Clinton in October of 2000, finding that McVeigh was innocent of any wrongdoing. Unfortunately, this was too little too late. The Indianapolis is a story of perseverance and a warning against ignoring precautions and the need for scapegoats when failures arise. We should never forget these men and their sacrifices that they made for their country. And that's just going to about do it for this episode. If you like what we're doing here, why don't you give us a like? If you want to see more, give us a subscribe. If you want to add anything or have any ideas for future episodes, let us know down in the comments. We appreciate you watching and hope you come back right here for more Sedgwick Jimmy in the future. Why don't you come check it out?